So for the last talk of our session, we're gonna uh, change tack a little bit and uh, as far as I understand, come back to a little bit more clinical uh, research happening closer to clinical approach. Um, and our speaker is gonna be Professor Jonathan Karapetis from Perth. Uh, he's the director of the uh, Talithan Kids Institute and is a clinician researcher with a special interest uh, and expertise in indigenous uh, health, in indigenous health. So he's made uh, significant contributions to, um, to the reduction of rheumatic uh, heart disease and um, is in particular interested in, uh, in, in the context of uh, Aboriginal health, uh, which shows a much higher uh, prevalence, uh, the population shows a much higher prevalence of these uh, disease types. Uh, Professor Karapetis undertook his medical training um, at the Royal Melbourne and Royal Children's Hospital here in Melbourne. Um, and he holds a clinical position with the Princess Margaret Hospital for Children in Perth and is a professor at the University of Western Australia. And it's a great pleasure to have you here today. Thank you. Um, it's great to be here. Let me begin by multitasking. Not good, I'm, I'm a boy. Um, I want to acknowledge the traditional owners uh, of this land and I'm sure um, that knowing that the, this institute has made a very significant commitment to Aboriginal health, particularly in the last few years, that, that the wisdom and partnership of those traditional owners is critical, as it has been to me, to my institute um, in Perth, and of course to my work in the Northern Territory over the years. Uh, I also want to congratulate Walter and Eliza Hall Institute for its, uh, its 100th anniversary and the celebrations. It's uh, obviously an amazing organisation and uh, thank them for inviting me here. It's always great to, be, to have an opportunity to come back to Melbourne. As Axel said, I trained here in uh, my medical school, in paediatrics, and this is also the place I got my first proper job after finishing my PhD. Um, so last night, as I was wandering from where I'm staying in Carlton through the university to come here for the, uh, the late afternoon session, I got all teary. Um, <laughs> And I was wondering, was it the emotion? And then I realised, no, it was just bloody freezing. <laughs> um, and I would point out that yesterday, it was a very wintry day in Perth, and it was 21 degrees. <laughs> so, um, as Axel said, I'll be taking you on a, something of a change of tack. Uh, I'm not a discovery biologist. I'm more of a, a clinician, epidemiologist, public health physician. And I want to talk about how... Uh, the work I've been involved in over the last couple of decades has really tried to take a much more systematic approach to a particular problem, rheumatic fever and rheumatic heart disease. Uh, but I also want to talk about uh, and bring you around towards the end uh, about how that sort of approach has really led myself and my colleagues to a very intense desire to revisit the biology. And that's where the partnership that we've developed with WeHi over the last few years has been fabulous. And so I want to particularly pay uh, my respects to Willie John Martin, to Ian Wicks. There are a number of other people at this institute who've been involved in some work that we've, we've joined in over the last few years. And that work is continuing, and I'll get to that point towards the end. I won't give you a lot of data on it, um, but I'll just give you a sense as to what that research is about. Because it really is a very strategic decision to to revisit the pathogenesis of rheumatic fever because we think that there are some very significant developments that we can, we, can, we can uncover in the next couple of years that will hopefully help us to control this disease. All right, so I better tell you a little bit about it um, and I'm gonna begin with some case presentations. Uh, this is a, these are tr two true uh, stories. This is a story of a five-year-old girl, an Aboriginal girl from a remote community in the tropical northwest of Australia. Uh, she presented to her clinic, she had two days of fever, she had swollen joints, particularly she had pain in her hip, her left knee, and she was short of breath. And she, as should be done, was quickly evacuated by plane to Broome. And that's the community that she comes from, quite a, a beautiful community, but quite a typical Aboriginal community, um, beset by the typical problems of overcrowded housing, of issues with hygiene infrastructure and the like. She had a high temperature, she was breathing rapidly, she had low oxygen levels in her blood, she had signs essentially of heart failure. And she had, when her heart was listened to, a heart murmur, a very significant heart murmur. And that 
for those of you who know, x-rays is not the sort of x-ray you want to see. That's an x-ray of a child in very severe heart failure with a big heart with lots of fluid in her lungs. She was diagnosed appropriately as having acute rheumatic fever, age five, very severe damage to her heart. She was treated for her heart failure. She was very severe, so she was then intubated. Um, she was started on steroids. She flew to Perth and she very quickly had valve replacement surgery. That's a nasty story, but she is one of the lucky ones. I want to tell you about the second case. And this is a seven-year-old girl, two years older, from Fiji. Um, and we've been working in Fiji for a number of years. This girl presented to her rural health centre with shortness of breath. <laughs> Not too dissimilar. She didn't really have the joint pains, but she had bad problems with her breathing. She went straight to the main hospital in Suva and had a very similar picture on her chest X-ray, a massive heart in severe cardiac failure. Um, she was transferred to intensive care, went into shock and died three hours later. Now, this is a, an all too common problem. It happens not so often in Australia. It happens a lot in developing countries. She had severe rheumatic heart disease. And the real tragedy is that she had presented over the previous couple of years with symptoms suggestive of rheumatic fever her, to her local clinic. And indeed, we've been running lots of workshops, training workshops, and, and these are now run by the Fijians about rheumatic fever in this country. And at the, her last presentation, Prior to this one, a nurse who'd been to one of those workshops recognised that it could have been rheumatic heart disease, told this to the doctor. The doctor dismissed it, said, don't worry about it. It's just a bit of the flu. And the real problem here, of course, is that if this had been recognised earlier, this death could have been prevented. So this is the disease we're talking about. It's a very real problem in settings of, of poverty. Uh, it's caused by this organism, the group A strep. So Daniel just talked to us about autoimmune diseases. We have a disease that's an autoimmune disease and we know the cause, uh, and that's rheumatic fever and also post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis. So this is the group A strep, and it's important to, to um, recognise that this is a disease that occasionally comes into the public consciousness with various manifestations, but overall, over the last 50 to 100 years, with a with the exception of this, this intermittent interest, has been largely neglected. But it's an intriguing organism. It causes the broadest range of manifestations of any microorganism on Earth, in that it causes quite common or very common superficial infections. It causes nasty invasive diseases. And then it starts getting really interesting, interesting with the toxin-mediated diseases. That includes necrotizing fasciitis, <coughs> scarlet fever, streptococcal toxic shock syndrome, this is necrotizing fasciitis here. Um, and then it gets really interesting because it also causes these autoimmune sequelae. And obviously, rheumatic fever, rheumatic heart disease is the one I'm going to focus on today. But you put all this together, and this is in the league table of nasty bugs. It's right up there. It's not HIV, malaria, TB, but it certainly is, um, kills a lot of people each year around the world. All right, let's focus just on rheumatic fever. And this is the pathogenic pathway. So, one is exposed to the bacterium, the group A strep. You then, if you're a pretty um, typical kid, you will get an infection in your upper respiratory tract, which is usually manifest as a sore throat. You'll get big swollen tonsils and pus, the classic strep throat. Some of those kids who get that infection will then, about three weeks later, develop this disease known as rheumatic fever. That's that presentation I talked to you about. Fever, swollen joints, maybe shortness of breath, some other unusual manifestations. It's a nasty disease. You usually have to go to hospital, but you'll, by and large, with some exceptions, you'll get better from that um, acute disease. But what can happen is that the disease comes back again. As you get re-exposed to the group A strep, you will potentially get recurrences of this disease um, because you have identified yourself as being susceptible. So not everybody is equally susceptible to this disease. And when the these episodes continue to recur, the damage that can occur to the heart can accumulate, and that's what we know as rheumatic heart disease. Big hearts that might need to be operated on. This is an Aboriginal man who's had his, his, um, his traditional scarring and has also got his heart valve replacement scar. 
And so this is the disease, obviously, that causes the vast majority of death around the world from this organism. It's the one we're trying to prevent because it can lead to heart failure, it can lead to infections, endocarditis, it can lead to strokes, and obviously um, can lead to death. And it's also critical to remember that this is not it's not so long ago that this was a problem here in Melbourne. In 1940s and 1950s, this talks about the US situation, but, but Howard Williams, the doyen of paediatrics in this town, pointed out to me that in the 40s, 50s, and even into the 60s, the, the major reason a child occupied a bed in the children's hospital was rheumatic fever, rheumatic heart disease. So it's not that long ago. And most of you will have a relative, an elderly relative who had the disease. So, you know, Auntie Edna, who's got a funny heart, that's, chances are that could be rheumatic heart disease. So it's not that long ago, yet it's disappeared from our consciousness as it's become a relatively uncommon problem in affluent societies. But it's a big deal around the world. So these are the sort of latest estimates. Well, actually, the latest estimates have it not that we probably have about 39 million people living with rheumatic heart disease in the world today, causes about 10 million disability-adjusted life years lost, about 350,000 deaths a year. Almost all of those are in developing countries. So as we've started to get much better data, we've realized that this is a, a significant problem, and it's a problem of young people, and it's a problem that's inherently preventable. And of course, as you heard, it's an issue for our Aboriginal people in this country, particularly in rural and remote settings. The best data are from the Northern Territory. These are the incidence data on acute rheumatic fever, um, I could sort of talk about this graph. Uh, we were getting quite excited in the Northern Territory when we sort of saw this happening. And then, of course, it's not been the same story since then. So we have a big issue. If you look at these numbers, these are incidence rates per 100,000. So, so essentially, you're getting over a period of time, you know, 1% to 2% of these kids over, an, over a number of years will develop acute rheumatic fever. And of course, that leads to high levels of mortality. The mortality is almost exclusively in indigenous males and females. And it leads to this accumulated problem of heart disease. So these are the prevalence data from the Northern Territory. I must update the slide, but basically about 2% of all Aboriginal people in the Territory live with rheumatic heart disease. In some communities, it's three, four to 5%. So it's a, it's a reasonably significant problem. All right, what I want to do is briefly take you through what we've tried to do about this problem. And it's, a, it's essentially, as I said, a systematic approach. If you go back to that pathogenic pathway, there are things that we, we can do at every step on this pathway to try and control this disease and to better understand it. And so what I'm going to do is just give you a rapid fire tour of where we're heading with research in each of these areas and then bring it together with what we're trying to do in a coordinated fashion. So if you go back to the burden of disease, we're finding much more about it. We're getting much better data. I'm focusing just in Australia. Obviously, we're trying to find more data around the world. So we're getting better at describing the prevalence of disease. We're getting better at understanding how much of a problem occurs, not just in the Northern Territory, where the best data are, but we're starting to get evidence that there is rheumatic fever happening all over the country. Yes, it's predominantly an issue of Indigenous people, but the, the dots that are open are cases of acute rheumatic fever in non-Indigenous people. So it still occurs around the world. We're getting better at understanding the existing data about, uh, and these are some, some publications we've done recently, by really exploring the, the routine data collected in the Northern Territory to better understand the natural history of this disease. But there are a number of unknowns that we're trying to look into now. What's the issue with rheumatic fever in our immigrant and refugee populations? How much of a problem is this in the urban setting, particularly in Aboriginal people living in Melbourne, Sydney, places like that? And of course, trying to talk the right language around the economic burden of disease. So burden of rheumatic heart disease, we've gone over two decades from knowing very little to knowing quite a lot. And this has been our major advocacy tool. Uh, in terms of exposure to group A strep, the, we're still trying to understand this better. There's better ways to, to both understand exposure and figure out how we can reduce the number of organisms that people get exposed to. Obviously, overcrowded housing is the major risk factor for rheumatic fever. Uh, and in terms of progress around really primary prevention, the most exciting initiative is the CANVAS initiative that you may have heard about. 
This is an Australian-New Zealand joint government-supported effort to try and fast-track a rheumatic fever vaccine. And I'm the Australian lead. John Fraser in Auckland is the New Zealand lead. I can talk to you more about it, but it's really saying we've got government support to work with a small number of, of developers who have advanced stage vaccine candidates to try and get one of them into a clinical trial for sore throat prevention with a view of potentially that one being the vaccine that could be taken forward. So for the first time in, in 20 years, I'm feeling quite optimistic through the Canvas project that we've got some progress in vaccine development. In terms of our response to group A strep infection, we're having to explore much more the risks of rheumatic heart disease. And to that end, there is a, a study that we have underway that we've finished recruiting for, um, which is really, and again, that's a study that began with the link with, with Wee Hai through Mike Inouye, who's across the road now. Um, and that's one where we've recruited 500 people in the Northern Territory with rheumatic heart disease, 1,000 healthy controls, and we're, um, we're currently analysing both the genetic data and also the data on the community involvement in these sorts of studies, trying to make a much better case for being able to do genetic studies in Aboriginal populations. So again, we're trying to recognise that, that we need to uncover what it is around the susceptibility to rheumatic heart disease and does this give us clues to pathogenesis that could lead to um, therapeutics and to diagnostic tests. Sore throat has been an issue that we've, we've struggled with. Those of you who know the, know the field know that we don't see a lot of sore throat in Aboriginal kids. We don't see a lot of group A strep in the upper respiratory tract of Aboriginal kids, yet the classic teaching is that that's what causes rheumatic fever. And so we are trying to understand that a bit better because there are some clues that maybe we've underestimated the amount of sore throats. Uh, there's, a, there's an incredible ex natural experiment. It's actually not a natural experiment. It's a, it's a countrywide experiment happening in New Zealand. New Zealand's made a major commitment to reducing the rate of rheumatic fever, and they've invested tens of millions of dollars in a massive sore throat diagnosis and treatment campaign uh, with a view, this is the rate of rheumatic fever in New Zealand, and this they've actually set a target, which is an incredibly ambitious target. And so there's been a big focus in that country on sore throat diagnosis and treatment, and we need to better understand whether or not we should be doing perhaps not the same thing, but whether we should have an increased focus on sore throat in this country. I want to come back to this slide because this is critical to the work that we've started together with WeHi. We don't have a diagnostic test for rheumatic fever. We rely on a clinical diagnostic set of tools called the Jones Criteria. What's been very exciting this year is that these criteria, first published in 1944, have been regularly updated and revised, have become, for various reasons, less and less useful for populations with high rates of disease. But what, and what we ended up doing a few years ago was developing our own set of guidelines in Australia. And the Jones criteria that were released this year really are essentially an adaptation of the Australian guidelines. In other words, we now have Jones criteria that every medical student is taught is the diagnostic criteria for rheumatic fever, I believe they have returned to become the gold standard. But still they're imperfect. And I want to come back to how we need much better tools for diagnosing and also that we need something that we can give people with rheumatic fever that will alter outcomes. OK, preventing recurrences. So when you get, if you go back to that pathway I told you, you get rheumatic fever once, you have a chance, a high chance of getting it again when you recount, when you re-encounter group A strep. And what we do is we give penicillin to people with rheumatic fever. We give it to them in intramuscularly injections into the thigh or into the buttocks for at least 10 years, every month. It's a big deal, but it works. If, if people get their penicillin injections, when they encounter a strep, they do not get infected, they do not develop rheumatic fever. And it leads to both, it stops progression to rheumatic heart disease and actually leads, to, in many cases, to resolution of disease. So it's the, it's the cornerstone of what we do around preventing rheumatic fever. <clears throat> the problem we've got is actually getting the injections into people. As you can understand, it's not a nice thing to have happen. You need a good health system. And we have appalling rates of adherence to secondary prophylaxis in this country. We are getting better. And we've, again, through the routine analysis of the data, we're finding that there is a 9% reduction rate per year in <coughs> recurrence rates. 
which is good. And so we currently have a big community randomised trial in the Northern Territory underway to look at a health systems intervention at the primary care level to see whether or not we can assist them to improve delivery of secondary prophylaxis. So we need to have a focus on primary health care to, um, because that's the, the front line of, of care for these people. But there's a whole lot of other things that we need to start um, exploring. The, we have neglected to date the lived experience with rheumatic heart disease. How can people be empowered to take more control over their own lives? And that's something we need to explore. There's also a very interesting project that we've, we've started, which is can we come up with a better form of penicillin? Can we come up with something that isn't a requirement for an inje a painful injection once a month for 10 years, perhaps a longer acting form? And that's a project that we have underway and I think it could, over the next few years, lead us to some exciting developments. We're getting much better at this, which is how do we diagnose rheumatic heart disease earlier? Classically, we wait until someone presents with heart failure and then they get hooked into the system. Or else if they happen to have presented with the acute rheumatic fever episode, then we can hook them into prevention at that time. But there are very many people, up to half of people with rheumatic heart disease, who have never had a known presentation with rheumatic fever. And what we've started exploring is whether using echocardiograms, ultrasounds of the heart, screening kids, whether we can identify kids earlier in their disease and then hook them into the secondary prevention programs. And so we've been doing a large study and we're currently um, undertaking the, and this, the data of this have been, have been published already, but we're currently undertaking a cost effectiveness analysis so that we can make some sensible guidelines around whether or not we should be screening using echocardiography for rheumatic heart disease. Without a doubt, there's a role for it in developing countries. The question is, in a country like ours with a relatively well-developed health system, is there a significant added benefit from trying to screen those kids early? And that's what we're trying to find out. We're realising that we've neglected rheumatic heart disease in pregnancy. Uh, when you're pregnant, you've got increased load on the heart, you can present with heart failure. And we've undertaken a study together with the Australian Maternity Outcomes Surveillance System, which is again looking at the problem of rheumatic heart disease in pregnancy. Around the world, this is a big deal. There are some data that suggest that somewhere between 10 to 20% of maternal deaths in Africa may in fact be due to rheumatic heart disease. And we need to understand that better because when we talk about Millennium Development Goal 5, which is preventing maternal mortality, we may have a particular angle we're using control of rheumatic heart disease that we could rely on. Now, I'm not going to... Uh, we're, we're getting better at medic, understanding how to treat people with rheumatic heart disease medically and surgically. I'll zip over that so I can get to um, this bit, which is a couple of years ago, the, the groups, the individuals, the organisations that have been involved in this work over two decades, obviously the Menzies School of Health Research, my institute, the Murdoch Children's, South Australian Health and Medical Research Institute, started thinking, how do we... We've got a fantastic collegial network of people working in all these different areas. How do we bring it together? And we did it through a CRE application, which was the best experience in research I've had, to try and get a unified vision around rheumatic heart disease. And so this is one that we've just kicked off. It's the End Rheumatic Heart Disease CRE. Why is it so special? In my mind, it's special because unlike any other CRE I've been involved in, it has a singular vision. And the singular vision is this, that we believe over a five-year period we can identify a set of costed, stepwise interventions most likely to reduce the incidence of rheumatic fever and the prevalence of rheumatic heart disease for Indigenous Australians to the same level as non-Indigenous Australians. In other words, in this country, we should be able to talk about eliminating rheumatic heart disease as a public health priority. There's one country in the world that should be able to do it. This is the one. And we believe that we can develop the end game report in five years to target that, which is where we got to this, which is to understand that an important part of the puzzle is the diagnosis and treatment of rheumatic fever. This is this... Um, this slide I showed before. As I said, we don't have a diagnostic test and there is nothing we can give to someone with acute rheumatic fever <coughs> other than 10 years of penicillin that we know has any effect on whether or not they're going to get rheumatic heart disease or die from it. So penicillin, which was 
first introduced for rheumatic fever back in the 50s, we're still relying on it as the only thing we can do. And that seems crazy for a known autoimmune disease. And when about six years ago, Doug Hilton contacted me and said, Walter and Eliza Hall Institute is very interested in doing something significant in the area of Aboriginal health. Um, and I was at the Menzies School of Health Research then, uh, took a fantastic approach, which is to say, let's think about are there things that, are there sets of expertise here that could really benefit um, problems in Aboriginal health? And we talked through it and the, one of the things that came out was, you know what, understanding the biology of rheumatic fever could help us with both of these problems. And that's led to, um, oh, and that's because this is the pathogenic slide that I've been showing for 20 years in rheumatic fever. And it, although it's obvious that there are some organisms that cause rheumatic fever and they have certain features that, that differentiate them from others, there are some hosts that are susceptible, but we don't really understand why. That leads to an, an abnormal immune response, which leads to acute rheumatic fever. The reality is that there's a lot of this is just a big black box, which is crazy. Now, of course, there's a bit more information, but maybe we can unravel that. And so um, we started looking at some of the details around what we do know about pathogenesis. We know that the M protein of group A strep, which is the biggest virulence factor, has a lot of um, both uh, structural similarities as well as cross-reactive epitopes with human tissue, cardiac myosin in particular. And so we know that there's this, this sense that there's immunological cross-reactivity, molecular mimicry as the stimulus for rheumatic fever. We know that there are certain um, genetic risk factors that appear to, to, to link to autoimmune disease. So if you look at the, 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 the table of different immune-related genetic risk factors, probably the biggest is the, is the TNF associations, but there are others there that, you know, none of the, other than TNF, none of them really leap out at you, but there are a number of associations that have been found in, in multiple studies. Similarly, a number of HLA-related, particularly the, um, the, the class two genes have been associated with rheumatic fever. So we've not, we've, other than knowing that there's, there's immune dysregulation, there appears to be various HLA type two associations, we don't know a lot more. This is, this is a review that Willie John's just published that, that tries to give a sense as to where we're at with understanding pathogenesis. That probably the stimulating event is a cross-reactive antibody with a group A strep that leads to, that, that binds to the endothelium, that leads to expression of adhesion molecules, that leads to recruitment of CD4 cells, um, and subsequent damage, probably complement mediated and functional antibody <coughs> mediated, which leads to further exp um, release of endogenous antigens, further stimulation of an immune response that appears to be probably Th1, Th17 mediated, and over time, uh, you get fibrosis and neovascularization, which is why the heart valves sort of contract. They're initially very inflamed and then they contract. So yes, we've got some clues about the immunological cascade that probably leads to rheumatic fever. And shouldn't this allow us to identify some potential immune targets for intervention? And so we are, we've started this collaboration um, Willie, John and Ian have been the leaders here, but there's been a lot of other people here involved in this collaboration. It began at Menzies and, and the people at Menzies have been wonderful supporters and obviously my institute has been more recently involved. And what we've done is we've collected samples and it's initially it's really just at a pilot study stage, samples from acute rheumatic fever patients and from a range of healthy controls in the Northern Territory. These numbers are not huge, but this has been a massive task to try and recruit these patients, get bloods in the acute stage and try and get convalescent bloods to just get consent for the study was not easy. Um, and what we have done is we've divided them into patients with high and low CRPs, uh, essentially in evidence of very active inflammation versus less, less active inflammation. And we've just put their samples through, through a range of different assays. We're obviously looking at the, the cell profiles um, here, there's been a multiplex cytokine beta ray study, the proteomics, we're now looking at metabolomics, and we're looking at functional assays, and more recently we've just got some, some transcriptomic data. So essentially what we're saying is, in rheumatic fever, we, to unravel the black box, we need to really use some modern technologies to understand. Now, 
what I will tell you is that the initial signals we're getting are quite exciting, that we are seeing very clear differentiations of the pattern between the, the low and the high CRP patients that appears to identify a range of proteins that could potentially be used for a, for a diagnostic test. That the proteomics similarly identifies a number of peptides if you look at rheumatic fever versus healthy controls and to a lesser extent healthy controls versus rheumatic heart disease, a number that appear to be particularly highly expressed in rheumatic fever patients. And, and this is where it gets quite exciting. This is work looking um, by stimulating PBMCs with group A streptococcus, looking at expression of a number of factors. So this is IL-17. We've looked at interferon and a number of other factors. Um, and, we've, and what we've started to do is to look at whether or not we can suppress that release using drugs. Uh, and this is the concept of drug repurposing. Are there drugs that are commonly available, already licensed on the market, that are cheap, that are well known to have, have good safety profiles, because that's the, cat, that's the sort of drug we're going to need if it's going to make a difference in developing countries and the population of interest. We're not interested in a $100,000 monoclonal antibody. We're much more interested in a drug that could be useful out in the field. And are there some, and there are some, that appear to be suppressing this um, response? And could this lead us to a potential clinical trial in the next few years to see whether or not we can alter long-term outcomes from rheumatic fever. So this is where we've gone from understanding that, that we need to take a multifaceted approach to rheumatic fever control, that we have a framework to try and do this through our end rheumatic heart disease CRE, where we've got researchers all over the country working on different bits of the puzzle. And we've also said that a very important part of the puzzle is understanding a better understanding of the biology and that's where this institute has been a fantastic um, contributor and indeed leader. And I think in the next few years, we're going to see some very exciting things. So I'm delighted that, that we can um, welcome Walter and Eliza Hall Institute into the field of rheumatic fever control. Uh, this will have impacts not just in this country, but around the world. Obviously, there's many people involved. Just some of the people on that slide I showed before are some of them. Uh, so, so thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for your ongoing contribution. And it'd be wonderful, wouldn't it, to be able to um, stand up as a Walter and Eliza Hall Institute member and say, we've made a major contribution to Aboriginal health in particular. Thank you very much. Well, we would like to thank you for this wonderful talk. And I believe you have a, tra uh, a plane to catch, so there might be I can take a call. Yeah. one or two questions. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Jonathan. It's uh, wonderful to see such progress in a great neglected disease. Uh, your optimism about a uh, vaccine, the potential of a vaccine in a disease which has got an autoimmune overlay, mm -hmm. is that simply because you believe that we will very soon know what immune response to what antigen induces resistance and not autoimmunity? Yeah, I think, I think we are... I mean, I, I oversimplified, obviously, what we do know about the pathogenesis, and we've, we've certainly... What we've got is vaccines that are being developed now very specifically to exclude epitopes that appear to be cross-reactive. We've got much better ways of monitoring that through um, both in the laboratory and also clinically. We already have vaccines that have gone into clinical trials. So in fact, there's been about 20 or 30 clinical trials over the years, most recently with a vaccine in the US that's been through you know, FDA supervised processes. So, and they've approved the ability to, uh, the, the type of monitoring that we've got. So, most of us don't believe that because we're using much more refined antigens than we used way in the past where they used whole organisms, that we believe we can target those antigens so that they're not likely to be cross-reactive. And indeed, the three vaccines that we're looking at, most advanced, one of which is Michael Wood's vaccine in, in Queensland, have all been very specifically tailored to avoid those epitopes. Do you see any increase in penicillin resistance in those individuals that get prophylactic penicillin every month for 10 years? Great question. Uh, if someone else in this audience wants to take this on to answer why is it that there has never, ever been a group A streptococcus isolate described that is resistant to penicillin, I'd love to know. But so other organisms, other organisms, no. So, so the, the answer is... There hasn't been a lot of work done on that, but we have looked 
to a degree at the rheumatic fever patients who receive long-term penicillin, and they have no higher rates of resistant, particularly pneumococci, would be the one we look at the most. Having said that, this is in a setting where highly resistant pneumococci are very common in the community, but there's no particular risk for, for resistance in those patients. And I guess our feeling is that penicillin is probably the most benign of antibiotics in inducing resistance. We see antibiotics like azithromycin and the later generation Kepler-sporins. They're the ones that really you see is resistance emerging regularly. But most of us who are infectious disease physicians would not be too concerned about giving someone long-term penicillin to, to put them at risk of resistance. Yeah. I just want to add a follow-up question about the penicillin use. So, um, because long-term, are you seeing just not clearance of the group A strep, or are you seeing reinfections throughout that time? OK, so the, the question was around the uh, long term. Are we seeing lack of clearance of the organism or multiple recurrent infections? <coughs> Rheumatic fever is because of multiple recurrent infections. So someone will get an episode of group A strep. The majority of those, those people will clear the organism. Some will be longer term carriers. The longer term carriers probably are not at huge risk of reinfection themselves or even of transmission. Most of the episodes of rheumatic fever occur because six months, a year, two years later, another strep will come in and reinfect. The whole issue of whether or not we need to focus on clearance of penicillin from the upper respiratory tract is a different story, and that's probably a, a lecture in itself because, because the organism's penicillin appears to be much less effective than it used to be at actual clearing, uh, clearing carriage. Hi. Um, you mentioned the, uh, about... Just wave to me. Where are you? Oh, there you are. Okay, good. <laughs> you mentioned about um, genetic susceptibility to the infections. I was just wondering if um, you've observed any um, comorbidities with, um, say, auto-inflammatory diseases. Um, some of the, the genetics you mentioned just reminded me of psoriasis and, exactly. and, and, yeah. and that sort of... Yeah. We haven't described that. In fact, it's been interesting that even for... for post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis, there are individual cases where someone might have developed both, but it appears that they're very separate diseases. Rheumatic fever patients have not been described to also be um, susceptible to other autoimmune diseases, to my knowledge. Now, having said that, most of them occur in populations where it's very difficult to get that data. But you would have thought back in the US in the 50s and 60s, where most of our rheumatic fever studies were done, that would have popped up. And the answer is there is, I can't give you another immune-mediated disease that I know that rheumatic fever patients have an increased susceptibility to. And there are post cases where that is the issue. And uh, autoimmune diseases, how not to confuse all clinicians trying to untangle what's going on. Yeah, I mean, scarlet fever is not an autoimmune disease, yeah. it's a like toxin mediated yeah. disease. Yeah. I'm not yeah. Right, we might have to finch here. Uh, it remains to thank us. Uh, thank you for a wonderful, inspiring talk. <laughs>